Hello, and welcome to Hidden History, an Odyssey Through Time. I'm your host, John Rodriguez, and this is the second episode of the podcast, Hidden in Plain Sight, Deborah Sampson and the American Revolutionary War. Before I begin, there is one thing that needs to be kept in mind. Like many other stories hidden throughout history, there are certain dates mentioned in this story that some scholars would dispute. For example, later records claim that Deborah Sampson began her military career in May of 1781, but Sampson's biographer, Herman Mann, wrote in his 1797 book that in the winter of 1781, Deborah was still trying to decide what sort of adventure she would get into while dressed as a man. Deborah worked with Herman on the book, giving him details of her life, and it wasn't until spring of 1782 that Deborah enlisted in the army. The dates that I used in this story were gathered mainly from primary sources and those close to Deborah in order to paint a portrait of Deborah that is as accurate as possible. Deborah Sampson is best known for disguising herself as a man to serve in the Continental Army from May 1782 to October 1783. She was also one of the first women to receive a pension for her military service and the first woman to go on a national lecture tour of the United States. But have you heard of her? Perhaps she was mentioned in school or brought up in conversation elsewhere? No? That's okay. Unfortunately, Samson's story is mostly lost to history. But how can that be when we live in a country where there is a female vice president and where the rights of women are the most protected in the world? If Deborah Samson's story was widely known like the Kardashians, perhaps she would serve as a role model for young girls today, an example of what can be achieved despite the odds placed against you. However, sadly, that is not the case. Samson's story hidden history that has remained long forgotten is the story of an American patriot and a developing nation that wasn't ready to honor a woman and her accomplishments. Deborah Sampson was born on December 17, 1760 in Plymouth, Massachusetts. She grew up in poverty with her father abandoning the family when Sampson was five. Deborah's father had been involved in a seafaring business, and after taking part in a voyage to some part of Europe, he was not heard of for some years. Later, the family was told that he had perished in a shipwreck. Deborah's mother kept her family together as long as possible after her husband's supposed catastrophe, but misfortunes arose that forced her to disband her family and to scatter her children abroad. Deborah was sent to live with relatives until the age of 10, when they could no longer afford to care for her. She was then forced to become an indentured servant to the Thomas family in Middleborough, Massachusetts, from 1770 until 1778. As an indentured servant, she was bound to serve the Thomas family until she came of age at 18. Although treated well, she was not sent to school like the Thomas children because Mr. Thomas was not a believer in the education of women. Deborah was able to overcome Thomas's opposition by learning from his sons, who shared their schoolwork with her. This method seemed to work out well for Deborah, for when her time as an indentured servant was over, Samson made a living by teaching school during the summer sessions in 1779 and 1780. She also worked as a weaver in the winter, and during her time teaching and weaving, she boarded with the families that employed her. It is reported that Deborah may have possessed other useful skills, such as woodworking and mechanical aptitude. Her skills also included basket weaving and light carpentry, such as producing milking stools and winter sleds. She was also experienced with fashioning wooden tools and other instruments, such as weather vanes, spools for thread, and quills for weaving. Deborah also produced pie crimpers, which she sold door to door. In the winter of 1781, Samson began feeling restless and wanted to travel and explore other pursuits. Knowing that her options as a young woman were limited, 
she came up with the idea of cross-dressing as a man and sought out the advice of a fortune teller to get some insight into her future. Samson's departure was delayed due to lingering winter weather, so as she waited for spring to arrive, she sewed herself a man's coat, waistcoat, and pants using the Thomas family sewing patterns and purchased a pair of men's shoes, hat, etc. It was during this time that Samson got the idea to instead join the military as a male soldier. Quote, Before she had accomplished her apparatus, her mind being intent, as the reader must imagine, on the use to which they were soon to be appropriated, an idea no less singular and surprising than true and important determined her to relinquish her plan of traveling for that of joining the American army in the character of a voluntary soldier. This proposal concurred with her inclinations on many accounts. While she should have equal opportunities for surveying and contemplating the world, she should be accumulating some lucrative profit, and in the end, perhaps, be instrumental in the cause of liberty, which had for nearly six years enveloped the minds of her countrymen." End quote. In May 1782, at the age of 21, Samson disguised herself as a man named Robert Shirtlift and joined the 4th Massachusetts Regiment in Uxbridge, Massachusetts. She arrived at West Point, New York on May 13 and was assigned to Captain George Webb's Company of Light Infantry. This unit, consisting of 50 to 60 men, were elite troops, specially picked because they were taller and stronger than average. Their job was to provide rapid flank coverage for advancing regiments, as well as rear guard and forward survey duties for units on the move. Because she joined an elite unit, Samson's disguise was more likely to succeed, since no one was likely to look for a woman among soldiers who were specially chosen for their above average size and superior physical ability. She was given the dangerous task of scouting neutral territory in what is today Lower Westchester County to assess British buildup of men and material in Manhattan, which General George Washington contemplated attacking. After striving a long time in vain to ease the distress of her mother and to exonerate the too intense burden of her own mind by writing, Deborah found an opportunity and enclosed to her the substance of the following. Quote, May 1782. Dear parent, on the margin of one of those rivers which intersects and winds itself so beautifully majestic through a vast extent of territory of the United States is the present situation of your unworthy but constant and affectionate daughter. I pretend not to justify or even to palliate my clandestine elopement. In hopes of pacifying your mind, which, I am sure, must be afflicted beyond measure, I write you this scrawl. Conscious of not having thus abruptly absconded by reason of any fancied ill treatment from you or disaffection towards any, the thoughts of my disobedience are truly poignant. Neither have I plea that the insults of man have driven me hence. And let this be your consoling reflection that I have not fled to offer more daring insults to them by pro-offered prostitution of that virtue, which I have always been taught to preserve and revere. The motive is truly important, and when I divulge it, my sole ambition and delight shall be to make an expiatory sacrifice for my transgression. I am in a large but well-regulated family. My employment is agreeable, although it is somewhat different and more intense than it was at home, but I apprehend it is equally as advantageous. My superintendents are indulgent, but to a punctilio, they demand a due observance of decorum and propriety of conduct. By this you must know, I have become mistress of many useful lessons, though I have many more to learn. Be not too much troubled, therefore, about my present or future engagements, as I will endeavor to make that prudence and virtue my model, for which I own I am much in debt to those who took charge of my youth. Samson signed this letter, Your Affectionate Daughter. On 
On July 3, 1782, Deborah Sampson experienced her first battle outside Terrytown, New York, where she took two musket balls in her thigh and sustained a cut on her forehead. She was taken to a French encampment where her head wound was treated, and while the doctor was away getting Deborah more medication for her head, she took the opportunity to remove the musket ball from her thigh with a pen knife and sewing needle. The other musket ball was too deep for her to reach, and so she carried it in her leg for the rest of her life, and her leg never fully healed. In the spring of 1783, Peace began to be the general topic, but since there was no official peace treaty, the Continental Army remained in uniform. On April 1, 1783, Deborah was reassigned to new duties, serving as a waiter to General John Patterson. By the summer of 1783, General George Washington was ordered to send 1,500 soldiers under General John Patterson to Philadelphia to suppress a mutiny of American soldiers. It was during that summer in Philadelphia that Samson became ill and had to be brought to a doctor, although that was the last thing she wanted to do. She was cared for by Dr. Barnabas Binney, who removed her clothes to treat her and discovered the cloth she used to bind her breast. Without revealing his discovery to army authorities, he took her to his house, where his wife, daughters, and a female nurse cared for her. On September 3, 1783, the Treaty of Paris was signed by representatives of King George III of Great Britain and representatives of the United States of America, officially ending the American Revolutionary War and overall state of conflict between the two countries. The American delegation, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay, proved themselves ready for the world stage, achieving many of the objectives sought out by the new United States. Two crucial provisions of the treaty were British recognition of U.S. independence and the establishment of boundaries that would allow for American Western expansion. The treaty is named for the city in which it was negotiated and signed. The last page bears the signatures of David Hartley, who represented Great Britain, and the three American negotiators, who signed their names in alphabetical order. Now here's a little interesting fact about the Treaty of Paris. To this day, only Article I of the treaty, which acknowledges the United States' existence as free, sovereign, and independent states, remains in force. On the day that Samson was to leave Philadelphia for West Point, Dr. Binney gave her a letter to deliver to General Patterson, a letter which revealed her gender. Dreading the contents of the letter, Samson waited a few days before finally delivering the letter to General Patterson. In other cases, women who pretended to be men to serve in the army were reprimanded, but Patterson gave her a discharge, some words of advice, and enough money to travel home. She was honorably discharged at West Point, New York by General Henry Knox with recommendations from Generals Patterson and Shepard on October 25, 1783, after a year and a half of service. After being discharged, Samson returned home to Massachusetts. On April 7, 1785, she married Benjamin Gannett, a Sharon, Massachusetts farmer in Stoughton, Massachusetts. The couple later had three children, Earl, Mary, and Patience, and they adopted a fourth child. In January 1792, she successfully petitioned the Massachusetts State Legislature for back pay for her service in the Army and was awarded 34 pounds plus interest back to her 1783 discharge. As we use dollars today, back then the currency was called pounds. The governor of Massachusetts who signed the granted petition for Deborah Sampson was Governor John Hancock, an American founding father who is best remembered for his large and stylish signature on the Declaration of Independence, so much so that the term John Hancock or Hancock has become a nickname in the United States for one signature. 
1797, Samson joined forces with the newspaper publisher Herman Mann, who ghost wrote a romanticized account of Samson's wartime years, The Female Review, or Memoirs of an American Young Lady. A few years following the publication of the book, in March of 1802, Deborah began a year-long lecture tour about her experiences, the first woman in America to do so, sometimes dressing in full military regalia. After praising the virtues of traditional gender roles for women, she left the stage, returned in her army uniform, then proceeded to perform a complicated and physically taxing military drill and ceremony routine. She performed both to earn money and to justify her enlistment, but even with these speaking engagements, her husband and she were unable to pay all the family's expenses. During the tour, Deborah visited Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and New York, and on her journey, she spoke in Boston, Providence, Holden, Worcester, Brookfield, Springfield, Northampton, Albany, Boston, and New York City. She made this journey alone and was often ill. During her stay in Albany on September 11th and 12th of 1802, Samson recorded that she had, quote, taken very sick with a toothache and ache in my face, end quote. The following day, she stated that she was, quote, no better, in extreme pain, no rest day or night, end quote. Despite these reoccurring maladies, she completed her lecture circuit and returned home in April 1803. Deborah Sampson had the honor of calling Paul Revere a friend, and he was a strong supporter of her right to receive a military pension. Revere frequently lent Sampson money and wrote letters to government officials on her behalf requesting that she be awarded a pension for her military service and the injuries that she suffered during combat. In a letter dated February 20, 1804, Paul Revere wrote to U.S. Representative William Eustis of Massachusetts on Samson's behalf, quote, I have been induced to inquire her situation and character since she quit the male habit and soldier's uniform for the more decent apparel of her own sex. Humanity and justice obliges me to say that every person with whom I have conversed about her, and it is not a few, speak of her as a woman with handsome talents, good morals, a dutiful wife, and an affectionate parent. She is now much out of health. She has several children. Her husband is a good sort of man, though of small force in business. They have a few acres of poor land which they cultivate, but they are really poor." End quote. After the lecture tour, Samson petitioned Congress again. This time, her petition seceded. On March 11, 1805, Congress placed Samson on the Massachusetts Invalid Pension Roll at the rate of $4 a month. Deborah also received back pay of $48 for each of the two preceding years. While this may sound like an insufficient amount to modern Americans, that $48 was probably more money than the Gannets earned from their farm in a year. In 1809, she petitioned again for back payment going back to 1783. This would have been a windfall, windfall of almost $1,000 for the family, but Congress balked. In 1816, her petition came before Congress again. This time, out of kindness, generosity, and maybe a little guilt, they approved her petition, awarding her $76.80 a year, or $6.40 a month. She found this amount much more satisfactory and was able to to repay all her loans and take better care of the family farm. Deborah continued campaigning Congress for the entirety of the money she was due until she was denied the remainder of her pay on March 31, 1820. In her final years, 
Deborah made her home in a beautiful mansion her son Earl had built. The home still stands there today. She and her descendants attribute her chronic ill health during that period to the musket ball that had been lodged in her thigh since the revolution. On April 29th, 1827, Deborah Sampson Gannett died in Sharon, Massachusetts of yellow fever. Few newspapers noted her passing and there is no record of a funeral or memorial service. The Gannets were too poor to pay for a headstone, so her gravesite in Sharon's Rock Ridge Cemetery was unmarked for more than 20 years. Even then, she was given only as Deborah, wife of Benjamin Gannett. Like so many revolutionary soldiers, she was all but forgotten for decades when historians began to re-examine the era. Her legend continued to grow, and on May 23, 1983, Governor Michael J. Dukakis signed a proclamation which declared that Deborah Sampson was the official heroine of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Two news services stated this was the first time in the history of the United States that any state had proclaimed anyone as the official hero or heroine. Her gravestone was later amended to read, Deborah Sampson Gannett, Robert Shirtliff, the female soldier. On March 1st, 1831, Deborah's husband Benjamin petitioned Congress for pay as the spouse of a soldier. Although the couple was not married at the time of her service, in 1837, the committee concluded that the history of the revolution, quote, furnishes no other similar example of female heroism, fidelity, and courage, end quote. Benjamin was awarded $80 a year, although he died on January 9th, 1837. On June 18, 1838, the U.S. Senate approved a bill for the relief of the family of Deborah Sampson Gannett in the amount of $466.66, the equivalent of a full pension. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode. Each episode of Hidden History will explore a story that has been hidden in the pages of history and needs to be told. Pictures and newspaper articles relating to a particular episode will be available on my website. Thanks again for listening. I'm John Rodriguez, and this has been Hidden History, an odyssey through time.